Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled Resilient Cloud Services Design Analysis and Evaluation. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A couple of administrative notes before we begin today's presentation. Uh, first, all of the phones have been muted except for those of the presenters. Second, questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of today's presentation. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables us here at CSIAC to conduct these uh, free webinars. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Salim Hariri. Salim is currently a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Arizona. Uh, Salim received his PhD in Computer Engineering from the University of Southern California and his Master's in Science from uh, the Ohio State University. Uh, Dr. Hariri is also the uh, University of Arizona Site Director for the NSF Center for Cloud and Autonomic Computing. He is the uh, Editor-in-Chief for Cluster Computing Journal, and his research interests include cybersecurity modeling and analysis, resilient cyber resources and services, and high-performance distributed systems. Uh, now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Hariri, and uh, uh, good uh, good afternoon, Salim, uh, I guess actually good morning in your case, and uh, so go ahead and... Uh... Okay, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, good afternoon, uh, depends on your time zone. Thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. It's really my pleasure to share with you uh, our ongoing research in cybersecurity and uh, with emphasis on the resilient cloud uh, services. So, uh, so the title for the presentations is Resilient Cloud Services, uh, but uh, uh, this is my outline for the presentation. First, I'd like to uh, introduce to you the centers uh, that uh, we uh, work on in the uh, university is called the Center for Cloud and Autonomic Computing. Just a little introduction uh, of that and uh, review also the ongoing uh, cybersecurity project that we are working on. Then motivate you that uh, why we need uh, resilience uh, in the uh, area of uh, cybersecurity. So there are many techniques we can do uh, solve the security issues, but we are going to emphasize the resilience. And then in the University of Arizona, we are aggressively pursuing a methodology called autonomic cybersecurity. So I will introduce that concept, and that will lead me to the uh, main focus of today's uh, topic or presentation, the resilient cloud services. Like the Center uh, uh, for Cloud and Autonomic uh, Computing at the University of Arizona, it's a multidisciplinary center that tries to foster collaborations between uh, industry, academia, and government. And we work on uh, closed terms uh, project uh, of interest to our members. Uh, and also with that, uh, we can educate the students on uh, projects of interest uh, to industry, government, and academia in the area of the cloud and autonomic computing. We also like to accelerate uh, the technology transfers uh, of the technology developed uh, at the centers. So uh, if you join our centers, the benefit uh, you will be able to collaborate uh, with faculties uh, at the university with the graduate students, and you will be able to choose a project of interest to you. And also you will have access to all the facilities and test that, uh, that are available in the university. And also you will be able to leverage uh, investment project 
at all the other uh, CAC members and sites. Currently, the center has sites. Uh, it's uh, Mississippi State University, Texas Tech University, and University of Arizona. This is just a brief introduction to the centers and uh, the benefits of uh, doing that. At the centers, as you can see, we have many sponsors and members uh, that uh, include governments, uh, industry, and we've been at the University of Arizona focusing mainly on the cybersecurity. So as you can see, the first one is the resilient cloud services that I will be talking about today. Then we have also a project sp uh, sponsored by NSF, we call it Cyber Security Scholarship for Service. So because, as you know, we uh, have uh, a severe shortage in workforce that are uh, expert in cyber security. So we have a couple million dollars research fund from NSF to educate U.S. citizen students on cyber security. And in return, after they graduate, they have to serve the government or the state for the period that they receive the scholarship. If the students got their master's and received two years of scholarship, then they have to work for government or state for two years. We have also project try to understand the psychology of the hackers. Uh, so what motivate them so, and what targets that they are after? <clears throat> and by uh, exploiting social media analytics, uh, that we call it the hacker webs. We have an education project in cybersecurity we call it Ask Cyber. And uh, one interesting project, I'll touch a little bit briefly about it. We call it Cybersecurity Lab as a Service. The idea is to use the cloud uh, as a service to offer cybersecurity lab experiment for students taking classes in cybersecurity. And we use it in, at University of Arizona to teach the students taking cybersecurity class on uh, cybersecurity. Uh, we are actively involved in Internet of Things and uh, how to make IoT services secure and resilient to attacks. So as you can see, we have uh, a good uh, number of cybersecurity, but today's focus would be on the resilient cloud services. Because most of our research in cybersecurity involves uh, what we call the anomaly behavior analysis. So that means it requires us to understand the norms. So as you can see, we have a test pad uh, to help us understand how cloud uh, services operate. Uh, if you have a high performance, uh, special computers like GPU, we have GPU clusters, we have a wireless uh, test bed uh, with all wireless technologies, uh, Bluetooth, ZBs, Wi-Fi. And we have also uh, smart buildings. Uh, as you can see, we have a clusters of homes. And <clears throat> we do research in uh, secure and protecting these. And also we have uh, uh, industrial process controls uh, uh, that we can do a smart grid. So this enables us to really uh, touch on all the technology that you might uh, see in the cyberspace and uh, secure and, and uh, work on algorithms to secure and protect that. So uh, we also uh, have uh, what we call the smart devices or uh, vehicles. So we have, like, as you can see, smart cars. Uh, we have, like, raspberries uh, and uh, microcontrollers and the and we just got the grant from National Instruments uh, to basically use uh, their uh, uh, NI grid automation systems to uh, emulate and do experiments uh, with the smart grid and uh, how to secure and protect it. So as you can see, we are uh, we have a state of the art test bed that helped me analyze uh, uh, the normal operations of these. Uh, uh, infrastructures and then uh, build algorithms to secure and protect them.
So this is uh, an example we teach uh, high school students about IoT and how to secure and protect uh, homes uh, uh, using uh, uh, Raspberry Pis and uh, microcontrollers. Now, uh, I don't think anybody needs uh, motivations why cybersecurity is uh, important today. So there's no one day that can go by without uh, reading the news about some successful attacks uh, against uh, our infrastructures, whether it's an industrial, finance, or government. The problem I want to emphasize, and that uh, helped me make the case for the resilience is that the intruder's knowledge uh, is uh, deteriorating so over the years. So that means to really launch a sophisticated attack, you don't need to be a computer science expert. Uh, uh, you could be very uh, novice users that would uh, download some libraries from the internet and you would be able to launch the most sophisticated cybersecurity attack. So our problem today in the cybersecurity is that the knowledge to launch uh, attacks is becoming less and less, and the sophistication of the attack is increasing exponentially. So, and another uh, problem uh, with the cybersecurity we are facing today is that the uh, the attack can propagate uh, very fast. So in the 80s. The attack was propagating uh, with weeks. Uh, now, uh, in fractions of a second, we could touch basically on So as you can see, the attacker's knowledge doesn't need to be very uh, uh, expert, and the sophistication increase the attack. Uh, propagations is getting shorter and shorter. And with that, uh, uh, it gives me that we need really innovative solutions in cybersecurity. And uh, one of the main problems that we must address is the insider threat uh, problems, is that because as you can imagine, uh, the insiders have access, privilege to everything we have. Uh, in the cyber resources and services, and they can easily inject uh, malicious uh, activities inside that. So we need to figure out that. And we, I feel like what happens with the fault-tolerant uh, computing, the fault-tolerant uh, computing features, we reach the stage where uh, fault uh, uh, where you know we cannot uh, uh, basically build cyber systems that are highly secure that cannot be penetrated. It's the same things we reached uh, before in the 70s about the fault tolerant computing. That means we cannot build computers that cannot fail. So if that is the case. Then some researchers start working on techniques to basically. Uh, build computing system that can tolerate failures. I think we are reaching that level right now. We need to build cyber systems and uh, operations that can tolerate uh, intrusions and attacks. I call this uh, resilient cyber operation. And the reason we have these uh, problems uh, because uh, most of our cyber security tools are manual, reactive, and isolated. And uh, until now, I haven't seen a lot of use of biometrics uh, in my in the cybersecurity solutions. So to uh, overcome these challenges of the insider threat and the resilient side, cyber operations, our research at the University of Arizona focus on what we call uh, autonomic cybersecurity. And the autonomic cybersecurity, the benefit from that, at any instant time, you have full visibility into your cyber space. You know exactly what's happening in the system. And also, in ACS, you are continuously monitoring your cyber resources, applications, you are analyzing them, 
And if you see any problems, uh, you mitigate that in a proactive way. So it is really like the uh, nervous uh, systems in our body. So so uh, now let me uh, tell you about uh, what is the cybersecurity solutions that we follow today. Uh, a little introduction and then I move on to our approach. Like most of the research we have today in the market, it's basically signature-based. So that means you have a signature and uh, you try to uh, look at the systems and see if that uh, signature match what you have in the database. It's easy to implement, uh, but the problem is cannot detect a new or modified attack. Or you could do the anomaly behavior analysis in the anomaly behavior, this is all what you focus on, which is a very good approach, right? It generates a high false uh, positive. But I will, when we, I describe our approach, I will show you how we were able to minimize uh, the false positives in the anomaly. Most of our cybersecurity research basically take that approach. So uh, what is the uh, challenge in the intrusion detection uh, systems? As you can see from these uh, simple diagrams, uh, our uh, cyber systems, the, the networks is very complex. We have so many different protocols, uh, DNS, uh, NFS, uh, DSCP, so we have uh, TCP, UDP, so all these protocols, very complex uh, systems. And to come up with a unified intrusion detection for all of them, it's just uh, not possible. So then it is hard to come up with a single uh, intrusion detection system that can accurately work for all the protocols. So what is the solutions we followed in the University of Arizona? We said we are going to do what I call it like a micro intrusion detection engine. So for each protocol, we zoom in. Let's take, for example, the DNS uh, protocol. I study the normal operation for that protocol and I come up with an intrusion detection uh, based on anomaly technique for that. So that is the approach. If you do that, then you would be able to reduce the high false uh, positive in the intrusion detection system. So the approach that uh, we follow then, it's a hierarchical approach. We zoom in on each protocol at the application layer, and we do behavior analysis for the normal operations. We come up with a model. We do the same thing for the transport the networks and the link layers, and then we fuse all the results from this behavior analysis. If you do that, then you would be able to really achieve a very high detection rates and low false alarms. So we built uh, at the university uh, a methodology, we call it anomaly behavior analysis methodology, that basically uh, systematically uh, able to apply ABE to any protocols, uh, any network protocols, any application. So we basically look at the uh, universal space as abnormal and normal. And then we build some representations for the abnormal and this, so which is really a subset of the universe. But uh, the hope is that this abnormal representation that captures a big versions of that, and the normal representation captures accurately the normal representation. And then we use data mining techniques, uh, statistical analysis, temporal and spatial behavior analysis. We come up with some models that tells me uh, when things are normal versus abnormal, and then I use that to uh, detect any attack. I'll give you uh, an example so briefly. Like, uh, for example, we took the DNS protocols, which is an application layer. 
uh, we built, uh, like as you know, the any protocols we have, it's a finite uh, state machine. As a finite state machine, we can build the finite state machines on the fly at runtime without any uh, manual. So we observe the uh, uh, the uh, request reply, all the messages uh, that are belong to the DNS, and we create these. And then we analyze uh, these transitions and come up with the statistics of these uh, transitions when things are normal and we put it in the database, and then any attacks against the DNS will basically violate the statistical uh, transitions inside that. Uh, let's, for example, uh, we look at the statistics, how to uh, move in that finite state, uh, and this is like the uh, anomaly scores. So you, any attack on the DNS protocols is a way uh, far from that. It is uh, separated. And that gives me the ability to have a high detections, uh, high detections uh, rate and with very low uh, false alarms. So uh, the reason because we focus on uh, very low levels uh, behaviors of the DNS protocols and we have the statistics. In fact, we look at uh, 600 million patterns of uh, using this, and then we can eventually reduce it to a couple thousand uh, patterns inside that finite state machine, and we have uh, accurate statistics about that. That's why we were able to accurately separate the norms and this. And this is an example. We launched all the DNS uh, attack uh, that we are aware of against these protocols, and we were able to detect all of these with a very high uh, accuracy. And this is uh, the norms, and everything else is the abnormal. So that's triggered by these. Uh, so this is really the essence of that. Uh, by doing fine grain behavior analysis, you could do a low false alarms uh, anomaly-based intrusion detections. So the second, uh, because of the issues that attack propagate uh, super fast, uh, we cannot really uh, handle the cybersecurity manual. So we are advocating an approach we call autonomic cybersecurity that is analogous to the human's autonomic nervous system. So the idea that we continuously monitor, analyze, diagnose, and then any anomaly detected uh, with little involvement of the users or the system administrators, we can take uh, proactive actions. So that's the methodology that uh, we are using. And the way we do that, uh, we basically look at uh, the fibers as uh, infrastructures, uh, data, application, users, community, and we continuously monitor that. And then we build uh, the normal profile of all these uh, uh, entities. So as you can see, we have a concept we call re uh, resource cyber DNA, data cyber DNA. So the reason we are using the DNA to tell you we have uh, applied a very fine normal behavior analysis for all these entities and come up with the unique runtime model that you really identify it's like your DNA. So if the user says, I am Hariri logged in, I look at your keyboard and mouse, I look at your usage of the uh, infrastructure, the data, the application, and I can say this is exactly what Hariri use when they log in. If somebody using my account, uh, then they would use the cyber and they will be using these resources different from the way I use it, and that user cyber DNA will detect it. So we are applying big data analytics uh, with the Sparks uh, environment because, as you can imagine, the amount of data we'll be gathering and analyzing, it's a huge. And then once we detect the anomaly, we generate alert based on policy, 
we can take action. But the most important I want you to uh, to pay attention is that it's a closed loop control systems like the, our uh, nervous system in our body. So we continuously monitor, we build data structures, we analyze it. If we see problem, we take an action. So that is the uh, ACS uh, approach, and this is just an example of uh, we're looking at the user, uh, could be say it's Hariri, so I'm looking at uh, how I use the mouse, how I use the keyboard, and I'm looking at your, my resource usage, the CPU utilization, number of cores. I'm looking at all the applications, and collectively I come up with a runtime model that captures that. So the second important concept that we need in the ACS is that we need to do continuous behavior analysis. So like as I mentioned in ACS, uh, we said we want to have a full uh, visibility into what's going on in my environment. So as you can see, these dots represent at any instant of time, where am I in that n-dimensional space? I use the three-dimensional, but in our uh, models, we use n-dimensional space. So at any instant of time, ACS gives you, I am here, and I know based on the normal model that I have, I should be going in this direction. But the nice things about it, when you are here and I go there, I immediately detect that this is really abnormal uh, regions and I can take an immediate action to bring it back. So by continuous monitoring and no, and having full visibilities where the system is at any instant of time, you can predict the behavior in the near future, and if you see any problem, you can inject it uh, in real time. This is an example like of a host. Uh, so I'm looking at a host here, uh, host uh, trust evaluation. Any host has many services, uh, like logins, uh, login failures, uh, memory load, and look at this, and I create a trust level uh, for all of these services when they are normal. As you can see, uh, the green indicate that. And the moment something wrong happens in that host, it's immediately the trust will be reduced to zero and somebody uh, will be notified and actions can be taken, shut down the computers, log in, uh, log out uh, the user's account, or whatever your policy says you should be doing. So this is like uh, we build uh, uh, capabilities to take an automated and integrated management. So as we analyze and then when we see problems, we take an action, and these actions uh, could be lock the machines, uh, restart, uh, uh, any uh, action that your policy uh, allows you to do. Like I mentioned in the beginning, cybersecurity, we have a huge, uh, a severe uh, shortage in uh, workforce. Even in our university educations, we don't have really sophisticated cybersecurity lab. So to solve that problem, we built a project we call Cybersecurity Lab as a, uh, as a service. We call it the class. And the idea of a class that all the virtual cybersecurity experiment can be offered as a cloud service. Like uh, if you want to do DNS, attack experiments, uh, distributed DOS attacks, uh, buffer overflow, cross-site scripting. We put all these experiments on the cloud and our students that are taking CE uh, class, uh, for example, uh, 509, which is a cybersecurity, we solve the uh, experiment uh, testbed or uh, the lab issue, the physical lab. So we offer the students, uh, they can log in at any time and carry the experiments uh, remotely on the cloud without the need to be physically in the lab. This is, for example, uh, uh, an experiment that uh, is really complex, uh, but can be more complex, but just involves firewalls, routers, protocols, which is uh, servers. And we could uh, 
transform this uh, without the users uh, do anything into this uh, virtual uh, experiment. And this uh, virtual experiment, the students will just focus on the vulnerabilities in this uh, test pad and this experiment and how bad guys can exploit it, how can you detect it and uh, uh, protect that environment. So the students doesn't need to build this environment. It's already built. They just focus on the cybersecurity issues. As also, like uh, with funding from the NSF, we've been uh, uh, training high school students uh, at the University of Arizona Biosphere uh, through the summers to teach them programming, uh, cybersecurity, and uh, how to protect uh, their infrastructures. And we've been doing that for the last two years. So we did the first one in July, and we did the second one in uh, July 2015. With these introductions, I gave you overview of the uh, capabilities and the ongoing research, because I felt it's very important that I cover that one. And now I'll zoom in on the resilient cloud uh, services. Uh, I don't think I need to uh, tell you about the benefits of the cloud computing. It is uh, the next generation's IT infrastructures because of all the benefit that we can get. We can increase the reliabilities. We pay as you go. Uh, it's on demand. So the cloud is uh, is a very important uh, infrastructure. According to the NEST, uh, they came up with the uh, a nice model really captures uh, what the cloud is all about. So what I'm going to highlight is basically uh, the essential characteristics of the cloud. You know, it's, by definition, the cloud should provide on-demand services. Uh, it should be uh, measuring uh, the services that offers, so you could pay as you use then it should be uh, rapid elasticity. It gives you the ability to scale up and down. And it's a broad network access. You can access it from anywhere. And it has a lot of resources that we can do. So these are the uh, essential characteristics of any cloud uh, system. Now, the way we offer it, we offer it in three forms, uh, software as a service, platform as a service or infrastructure as a service. And we deploy the cloud is, uh, in private uh, or public. And now there's a hybrid that combines both, and there's a community version of that. So I mentioned that these are the uh, ways the cloud is being uh, offered. And this is the deployment. So I need to emphasize on the security aspect. What is the main <coughs> problem in the, uh, the, what are the major pain in the uh, cloud uh, uh, security? Uh, in my opinion, these are the main three challenges that we have. So in the cloud, uh, the biggest problem we have is a loss of control. <clears throat> when I put my data and my applications on the cloud, I basically lost <clears throat> control of my data and my application, and that's a major concern. And the second uh, major concern is the lack of the trust. So I'm using a cloud provider, uh, and I do I really trust this cloud provider that when I put my data on the cloud, uh, my data stays in the U.S., for example. So maybe it goes to China or uh, other countries. So, so how do I guarantee that my data is there? So we really don't have a means uh, of that. And if they say I can uh, maintain the integrity of the data and uh, I can maintain the confidentiality, but uh, what certificates or verification that you have. It's a huge problem, and there's a lot of research in that area to do what we call cloud transparency. Can I, as a user, see exactly what the cloud provider is doing with my data and my application? 
The other uh, main issue is the multi-tenancy. So you have many users uh, sharing the same physical resources, and that could be a big problem. So I, I did touch on the last uh, controls. Uh, so how do we handle the security in the cloud? Uh, really, you need to come up with a threat model. Uh, in the threat model, you identify the attacker's mechanisms, uh, the assets or the targets, and their impact, and then you rank them and choose to mitigate uh, uh, these uh, threats. So this is an example for the cloud. Uh, you could uh, have uh, like an attack, we call the cross-site scripting, so SQL injection. So you go to a database and inject some malicious code on that. And you could be targeting the cloud users or the cloud applications and the impact. As you can see, by doing this, you would be able to identify the attacks the targets and the impact, and you could prioritize that uh, to satisfy your security requirements. In another way of looking at how we deliver security in the cloud, uh, you have the two uh, main entities. So you have the cloud providers and you have the customers. So as uh, if we are offering the cloud uh, software as a service, then the provider has to handle the security for the application, uh, the development platform, the computing, the network, the storage. If the cloud provider is offering you infrastructure as a service, he will just make sure the computing, the network, and storage are secure, and the rest are basically the user's uh, responsibility. That means in IAS, the user is responsible for the software and the applications. If you are doing the platform as a service, the user would be responsible for the software applications, and uh, this one would be part of the uh, uh, cloud provider. So, uh, like as I mentioned, the biggest problem we have in this is that do I really trust this uh, cloud provider? and uh, how can I have full visibility into that the cloud? Uh, and because of that, uh, we feel the uh, promising solutions uh, for the cloud security problems is the resilient approach. And I'm going to argue that, that the resilient approach basically uh, solves the problems that you have with the Lost of controls and the trust in the cloud provider and the multi tenant The resilience is based on three principles, uh, moving target defense, the cloud diversity, and autonomic computing. So when researchers start advocating the, uh, the moving target <coughs> strategy, <coughs> our problem is that our environment is static. And uh, frankly speaking, there's really no reason for my infrastructure to be static. So, so if it's a static, that means I give the attackers plenty of time, uh, uh, like you could say, t, t is infinite, to figure out uh, the vulnerability in my system and uh, uh, launch an attack. In the MTD approach, one is like a the grains uh, MTD uh, like that is the approach we take in our research uh, we basically randomize or encrypt the execution environment. So the bad guys have no clue what programming language I'm using, what operating system I use, and what physical resources. Uh, that's what I mean by the randomization. So we developed uh, at the University of Arizona a concept we call software behavior encryption. I want to encrypt my execution environment like we encrypt the data. So the bad guys, well, they are observing 
my execution environment, they have no clue what kind of operating system I'm using, what machine, uh, what programming language. So I call this encrypting the execution environment or encrypting the software behaviors. We use uh, diversity uh, by uh, hot shuffling software variants. I will explain that. So software variants, you have uh, an application, and I have two versions of this application, one written in C, one is written in Java. So that is the diversity. So if the guy figured out how to do buffer overflow in the C program, uh, that will be different in the Java. And I use redundancy, and then I do random selections of that. So the idea of the moving target defense is uh, really simple. So any attackers need some time to probe, construct, and launch attacks. So let's assume this is the time it takes. And if my environment stays static, doesn't change, then this guy can launch an attack on this environment and be successful if there are vulnerability can be exploited. However, if I use the MTD approach or the software behavior encryption that we are advocating, this is the time it takes you to launch the attack. So when you probe and construct, you build it on uh, version two. When you are ready to run, I move to a different version, version one or version four, so your attack will not be successful. So the resilient cloud, we build uh, a prototype system. In fact, uh, we demonstrate that to the U.S. Army, Netcom, uh, that uh, concept. So you, as the user, you could specify your resilient requirement. And we have resilient middleware that gives you the, the diversity level you need, the redundancy levels, and the shuffling. And there's a configuration engine that will use the cloud to build this machine. And we have, like as we, uh, uh, in the applications resource repositories, we have all the VMs that we need to build the uh, required uh, resilient uh, executions. Uh, for example, let's say I have uh, cloud systems with two racks and each one has uh, uh, thousands of machines. And I select one machine to be the controller and I randomly select. If you are an insider, uh, you have no clue out of uh, these uh, machines that I'm using which one I'm going to use. I randomly select these, but look, even if you are insider, uh, you have no idea which machines I will be using. And then I go and select uh, random machines to be also the workers. And in these workers, uh, I have... Uh, uh, VMs that can take uh, worker roles, uh, master, supervisor, usually we lump this into one function. As you can see, we randomly selected uh, this uh, machine uh, to be the supervisor for, say, map uh, reduce application. During the map computation of cloud applications, I chose this, and this uh, then will ask the workers to do the computations, and once they finish, they pass the result to the supervisors, and then I go and uh, to the checkpoint, and then I basically, in the next phase, which is a map or reduce, I will have a complete a new uh, environment, a completely new and random environment. So if you are insiders, outsiders, the loss controls, all these loss controls, the multi-tenants problems, it's solved with that architecture because uh, I'm guaranteed that my environment keep it changing to the level that nobody can exploit it. So to validate our approach, uh, we uh, uh, basically uh, applied uh, three classes of applications. The first one was the MapReduce application. Uh, second, the linear equation solvers. Uh, and we have also MeBench. Uh, so this is an example like what I mean by version. So we created for the MapReduce application so we have Linux operating system and Windows, and we have Java 
and C++. With that, we created up to 12 versions of the same MapReduce functions. And then we basically randomly, as I mentioned before, we select the machines that we want to run, and we select the versions, and these are all random versions, and then we do it during this phase acceptance, and then we go to phase two, and phase two, a new set of machines, new versions, and so forth. So we, uh, as you can expect, that if uh, a bad guy launch attack against the MapReduce version four, I still have two versions that I can use to tolerate. Even if I have another attack here, I still have other versions that I can tolerate. Uh, and and uh, this is an example of a denial of service attack on one uh, version. And as you can see, the execution time uh, with move to basically could go to infinite stop the machines, but with our approach, the execution time was not affected. We also studied the insider threat. So, uh, because as I mentioned, this is one of the biggest problem we have is the insiders. Even if the insiders uh, we still uh, can tolerate that without any problem, and the overhead usually around 11 to 20%. And we publish several research papers that document uh, the performance, uh, the overhead of our approach. The second uh, applications we look at uh, is really the linear equation solvers. And the idea here is, is that, okay, we know you did the map reduce. Can you do it for any application? So we said, okay, let's take any application. We picked linear equation solver. You could pick any other. And, uh, and we said, this application, I'm going to run it uh, through, say, two phases. Uh, phase one, which is a random period, and phase two, which is another random period. So I run the application up to here. I freeze it, checkpoint it, and then resume. And every phase will have a different version, uh, different uh, execution environment. So for that uh, linear equation solvers, we have uh, C, C++, Fortran versions, and we use Windows, Linux. So that created many different uh, versions. And we basically then, in this example that uh, we have, we decided to run the applications over three phases. Uh, and as you can see, if the size of the application increased, the overhead reduced. Of course, if the application size is small, uh, that would be uh, overhead is high. So also we run many different attacks and the systems can easily tolerate these attacks because uh, in this approach, uh, our goal is not uh, attack detection. So our goal is to tolerate this attack and make them uh, ineffective. We also uh, benchmarked our approach uh, on a, like a me bench uh, benchmark. So we look at basic math applications. Uh, we look at diecast algorithms and create similar versions. And as you can see, as the uh, uh, size of the problem uh, increases in terms of the computation, the overhead reduces uh, to an acceptable level. And we also studied like uh, how many phases do you need, uh, two or three or four. As you can expect, the number of phases, when they increase, the overhead is increased. But uh, if you go with uh, one or two, then the uh, overhead would be less. We did work out uh, the uh, what uh, theoretical approach to determine uh, what is the ideal number of phases that you do. And that's what we did in the resilience modeling. But because I'm running out of uh, time, I will just uh, show you the results. So, so for example, we took an application that is really vulnerable, so 90%. So that means the probability of a bad guy can exploit the application is 90%. And we took one application as uh, the probability of exploitation is only 0.1%. So as you see, if we add the three levels of 
uh, redundancy in the system, we almost bring the probability to zero. Even with the um, application that is very vulnerable, to, with this uh, resilient approach, so we can bring it almost to zero by increasing the number of levels. Most of the time you are here, so we expect with two, with redundancy level two, you would be able to tolerate uh, any potential attack against your application. So the, the Navy uh, gave us an award, but then because of the budget cut, uh, they couldn't uh, fund us the, uh, on hold right now. They want to take this approach and uh, apply it to the Navy Tactical Cloud. And the idea that uh, every ship uh, becomes uh, part of the cloud, and we want to make these operations resilient to any type of attack. So we can apply it to resilient to crisis management in cities and towns and battlefields, uh, resilient smart grid. So uh, the conclusion, like, uh, cloud computing is, uh, is really the paradigm for IT, and some look at it as a re uh, incarnation of the old mainframe. Uh, so the cloud security concerns are loss of control, lack of trust, and the multi-tenants. And I showed you that if you to take the resilience and the economics, we can solve all these uh, issues in the cloud because I dynamically change the environment because of that uh, the uh, I'm confident the providers have no clue uh, what resources I'm using, what version at certain instant of uh, time in the execution. With that, uh, I will be happy to take any questions that you might uh, have uh, uh, about uh, uh, the our approach for cyber security. Steve, yeah. Any questions? Or yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Salim. Uh, it was a uh, very, uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, to our attendees that are still on the line, I would just like to see if you have any questions that you'd like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Hariri while you still have the chance and. Uh, so uh I guess I, I think you you did touch on it, but uh so I was I was curious as to the um you know the different um uh actions the system can take. Uh so that that's basically determined by the policy that the individual users uh set. Is that is that how that uh would uh would operate? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It depends on the applications uh, that uh, we are <laughs> dealing with, and uh, it also depends on the anomaly that being detected and its impact. That's why I put that uh, threat model. So I detect this uh, attack, and uh, this attack is targeting this resource, and this is the impact. And based on that, you can come up with a policy that has uh, I have to shut down all my external uh, communications, so or it's not a big deal. I can shut down that computer. So it really depends on the uh, severity index of the anomaly that uh, has been detected. Okay, okay. Uh, so one of one of our attendees uh, wants to know if there are any sample templates uh, that would be available for for them to. Uh, uh, utilize and uh, you know do some testing on their own. Uh, we like we don't have uh, really like a template uh, that we can give, and the, the algorithms or the environment uh, it's still like in uh, research and development. But if somebody is interested, we can figure out a way of providing. Uh, them with the environment uh, so they can do testings and validations. So uh, he or she can send me an email. Okay, all right. And let's see, we have a, another question. Um, 
one of our participants, uh, would like to know if you've analyzed uh, the program rel reliability across different operating systems and different types of codes uh, with a higher chance of bugs in the code. Have, uh, have you done anything of that nature? Uh, the, you know, the ideas like I showed uh, in the uh, in the in the resilience analysis, for example, uh, as you can see, can you see this uh, slide? Uh, this uh, the probability of or, it. Yeah, uh, probably, so as yeah. you can see, yeah, this uh, this code is uh, highly unreliable. So it's 90% anybody can penetrate and exploit. It's full of bugs and uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, by uh, using our techniques, so we were able to reduce that uh, with uh, level three to almost zero of penetrations. Yes, we did uh, uh, study these problems uh, and the concept that help you quantify it, we call it the attack surface. So the attack surface is in the code that you have, all the procedures, all the functions, uh, everything you have in your code, uh, uh, the attack surface gives you a uh, way where the attackers can be uh, penetrating into that and the reliability that you have. We <clears throat> look into that uh, problems and uh, we have funding uh, we, uh, from the Air Force uh, to do resilience, uh, uh, data, data, the dynamic data-driven resilience applications. Uh, yeah, we, we look into these problems and we publish some papers on that. Okay. Um, so I, I guess one question I have, or if 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 you uh, have an idea, so so you know this is you know an R and D kind of project. Uh, so I guess kind of. You know what what level of uh, the technology readiness level? I guess the TRL level. Do you do you have any idea where you'd rank your this project on that TRL scale? I think it's ranked. Uh, it's like uh, for uh, TL like uh, three levels because uh, uh, as I as you know, Steve, we have a, a startup cyber cybersecurity company called Avertech that licensed that technology and the NETCOM, the U.S. Army NETCOM, asked us to build a prototype of that environment uh, so we can demonstrate. And we did. We do have a prototype based on uh, OpenStack and uh, VMware of that environment that we demonstrated. At, I think I would say at the TL like level three, and the Navy also gave us a contract, but unfortunately the contract is on hold now due to budget cut, but they want us to deploy that uh, for the Navy Tactical Cloud. So I would say uh, it is very robust, uh, ready for uh, deployment, uh, testing, and evaluation. Okay. All right. Very, very good. Uh, let's see. Uh, unless... Unless there are any other questions from our attendees, I'll uh, once again thank you, Salim, for the uh, presentation. It's uh, very interesting work that you're you're doing and uh, uh, very important. And thank you for uh, taking the time and sharing this uh, inf information with us today. Okay, thank you, everybody. And if you have any questions uh, you want to follow up, please feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.